Okay, I just got done filming for like, I don't know, I think it's been three or four hours. I just got done filming a really long video and I realized that I forgot to say hello to everyone. So, uh, forgive my already raising um, loaves of bread and my disheveled, probably like smeared makeup face. Um, and let me tell you, welcome to Wild Ginger's Urban Homestead. Uh, today we are going to be baking bread, making yogurt, and talking about chickens. Um, grab your notebooks if you would like to take notes because this will be one of those videos where you might want to jot down some information or remember things in your brain. Um, we are going to go from here and rewind to the beginning of the morning where our day started. Um, yeah, hope you enjoy. One of the things I am working on today is making yogurt. Now if you haven't tried making yogurt before, find a recipe and do it. Um, the, the recipe that I got from my mother-in-law is awesome. Now I haven't mastered it like she has. She makes like the creamiest, tangiest yogurt um, and mine is still getting there. Here is my sack of yogurt and I just knot it up and I actually instead of tying it in a knot I just hook it through this string and hang it from my cabinet door and all of the whey drips down. We use our whey um, for many different things. We Mostly I just put it in our dog food because it helps to hide the pills that my older dog takes um, in the morning, otherwise she'll spit them out and leave them in her dish. So um, when I have whey, I, I use that in my dog food. But you can also use it um, like as an electrolyte mix for chickens. I guarantee you, you have uses for whey um, after you've separated it from your yogurt. Um, I also, one of the reasons I wanted to show it to you is that Making your own yogurt at home is a frugal thing to do. Um, soon, Shortly after I started making my own, um, Woody questioned it. And he said, well, I love that you are learning a new skill and that's really good. But now that you know how to do it, um, are we saving money? He's right. Um, we should be making sure that something is cost effective. Having the skill is valuable, but is it actually saving us anything? We went to Costco that week and we checked the price of yogurt and it is in fact about half the price. The yogurt at Costco was double the price um, for actually a smaller amount than what a, a gallon will make us here at home. and so. Um, we decided to continue making it at home. It's so easy, and uh, we often find ourselves we often find ourselves at the end of a grocery season on a gallon of milk that is about to expire. And so, um, having that skill of being able to make yogurt or even just like a farmer's cheese or ricotta or something like that is really valuable because it helps you to not waste. We hate waste in this household. Yeah, I wanted to show that to you. I'm also going to be attempting a loaf of bread today. I am not the bread maker in this house. Woody is the baker. I do the things like making cheese and yogurt. But I feel that bread making is such a simple skill. Everyone should be able to do it. 
Um, and even if your loaf turns out, let me show you. Let me show you an example of the bread that I made. It was supposed to be a sandwich loaf. Look at, oh, I need it. I just, I have to take it out of the bag to show you what. I forgive you, honey. Thank you for coming to apologize. Okay, this is the loaf of bread I made last week. And so we are going to attempt another one, but this was supposed to be sandwich bread. Mom, can I be with you too? Look how flat that is. Oh dear. <laughs> Mom, can I be and, with you? And, um, yeah, you can be with me. So I, I sliced it anyways. Um, by the way, these are, these are hand measured slices. So, I am... I am going to be making some bread today and talking about chickens. I haven't even started with chickens, honestly. Even though I'm filming the video now, I am still procrastinating. I don't know why. I, I maybe just have this fear that, I don't know. There's no valid fear other than I'm gonna like stumble over myself, but I do that anyways. So we're going to get this ball rolling. I'm going to grab all of my ingredients that I need for making my bread and we're going to get started. And no, left to fold. Lift, lift, lift to fold. Lift, lift, lift to fold. Lift. I forgot that I have animals outside <laughs> that need to be fed. So we're going to run out there really quick. Now we feed our chickens just a layer crumble or, or a pellet, whatever is there at the store that we grab first and um, a very small, this is about a half cup or so that I'm giving all four chickens. Oh, surprise! Once every few days. Um, we were overfeeding them. We had a small incident, one way or another. The dogs actually got into the chickens and, and we lost three. One of them was not even found. <sighs> Only feathers. The other two were, are, are, will be dinner. Unfortunately, it was two of my favorite chickens. And don't we know this is how it goes. In preparing chicken dinner, we discovered that we've been overfeeding our flock. Like, massively overfeeding our flock. I was surprised at the end of it that there was even anything edible left on those two chickens. Yeah, so they're on rations now. Okay, so on to our lesson now as I'm preparing to make bread. Chickens are native at least history tells us, native to the jungles of Asia. 
if you've seen these wild birds, you'll know <laughs> just how scrawny and wild and ugly they are. In fact, I can show you a few pictures because I got to see them when I went to visit my mother-in-law recently. So, from Asia, the chickens traveled through Europe during the Hellenistic period where fighting troops discovered that cockfighting is really fun. Um, and then subsequently discovered that um, chicken meat is delicious as well as the eggs. And so from there they developed um, through Europe as, as an animal bred and kept for food. Chickens were developed in Britain around 55 BC um, into us to be used as food. So meat, eggs, that kind of stuff. Um, they were then brought over to the U.S. Uh, around 1850 um, as more Europeans um, continued to, to migrate to the U.S. And they were developed here as um, a small livestock homestead animal. Now, um, this is all stuff that you know if you know your American history. You know that that it was Europeans that brought a lot of these things over from Europe um, after having developed them. Now what I didn't know, what I didn't know until I kind of did this little study for you guys was that chickens were a woman's livestock on the homestead and so, which may, I mean it makes sense. Practically they're small, they're inexpensive to keep and to raise and even to purchase as chicks. Um, they, they reproduce readily, most of them. It makes sense because while husbands are out, you know, running a farm and trying to have, have their families be fed and housed and doing a lot of the harder labor, um, I would hope that a woman could be at home and still provide dinner. Um, there are a lot of cases also in those early days of American history when women's, women lost their husbands and had to be able to survive without them and, and chickens made that possible. And so I'm thankful for them today and it makes it a blessing to be able to um, further that heritage, I guess, that American, that American dream. <laughs> Uh, I feel that a lot of that is lost on my generation, that value of that history and the practicality of it, um, it went today when it's so easy to go and buy a chicken at the store. Chickens didn't usually stay in a hen house like they do now. Um, that, is a, that is a recent development in the keeping of chickens that they would be stored in a hen house or a bird house. Um, usually chickens just lived in a barn. Um, with other livestock at night and they were allowed to run around and free range and forage um, during the day in the fields or wherever they could find a good spot. Fifty years after the chickens arrival in the US they, they started to be used and bred um, in an industrial way meaning they were selectively raised to be meaty birds or good egg layers and um, it really is a study in genetics to see how those breeds have been developed and continue to be developed today. There are many hatcheries around um, the US that still are developing new breeds of chickens to be able to either lay eggs well or to provide a lot of meat. After the industrializ industrialization, say that three times fast. Um, following the industrialization of chickens, um, we now make our way to U.S. present day. Um, this means a continued use of, of a kind of a mashup of the industry and free-ranging methods for um, people that are raising chickens. Um, there's been quite a movement in trying to treat our food resources, especially those that are living, breathing animals, um, in a humane way. And the, the modern homesteader does that. Raising your, raising your food at home 
and doing it yourself, it makes our economy more efficient, right? So maybe there's maybe there's someone there around that, and I know there are even in my city that that don't have the ability to keep chickens, nor the knowledge or skill to keep chickens, and. So in order to make that resource more readily available for others and, a, and cost effective for others, I will keep my own. And that means a more efficient price point both for the farmer of the chicken and for the person that is trying to buy eggs or meat or whatever it is. It means I've, um, I've made way for someone else to have that resource because I'm able to make it on my own. Okay, so now that I've kind of discussed at, at quite length the history um, of chickens and kind of their role in the development of American farming and homesteading, we'll talk about some of the different classes and varieties of chickens um, that are available today, kind of what those different types of chickens have developed into. And so, um, the first that I want to hit is a, the American class. Now, these are, for example, Jersey Giants, New Hampshire's, Plymouth Rocks, Rhode Island Reds, and Wyandots. These are some of the favorite chicken breeds of American homesteaders um, to this day. Um, reason being, they're excellent dual-purpose birds, um, which means that they, if fed the proper diet, they can either be meat or egg-laying birds. And not only this, but they tend to be pretty good foragers, pretty good mothers, and um, cold-hardy. All of the United States are in North America, and um, so having a cold-hardy bird is something that is uh, is necessary even in some of the southern states you tend to get cooler weather in the winter and so having a bird that can kind of um, straddle that line of super hot and super cold is excellent. I've really appreciated having the heritage breeds um, on our homestead. The second class of birds is Asiatic or Asian. Um, also heavy, dual purpose birds. They, these are the ones that you'll often see with feathered legs. Um, they're typically brown egg layers. Also broody, good mamas and friendly. Um, among which are Brahmas, Cochins, and Langshans. Third category we have is continental um, the continental class and most of these birds were developed in Belgium, France, and the Netherlands. Um, they tend to be more energetic. They are less likely to be broody, which means to sit on eggs and, and hatch them and raise chicks. They're less likely to do that. They're a lot more active. Um, they're not, they're really not pets. They don't they don't want to be held, they're going to be evasive, and uh, just not as <laughs> not as interested in making friends. Um, among these will be Houdans, Favrels, Morans, Polish, and Well Summers. You'll notice some of the French names on that list. The fourth class I have is English. So. Um, these are developed in the UK as well as Australia. Um, these are broody, noisy, active, and they need to free range. Um, they are not some that you can keep in a little coop and think that they'll be alright. They, they won't be happy and they'll probably suffer. Examples of the English class are Australor Australorp, excuse me, uh, Cornish, not to be confused with Cornish meat chickens, they're the Cornish cross. Um, Orpingtons and the Sussex. Our fifth class is Mediterranean, which were developed in Italy and Spain, the regions around the Mediterranean Sea. Um, now these are exceptional at foraging, at predator alert, um, and examples would be Ancona, Andalusian, and Leghorn. 
Now, I can appreciate a chicken that will alert at a predator. Um, my, my flock is quiet, which explains why, why my dogs were able to get a hold of them the other days. They were so quiet, I didn't even know until a chicken was right at my door and she clucked so quietly, I didn't even realize it was a chicken at first. Having some kind of livestock guardian, even if it is just another chicken, will be invaluable. Okay, our sixth category is kind of a mashup of different, um, and I kind of have made it also just like a recently developed, I guess, um, breeds or <laughs> breed category. Um, but it consists of Americana, Naked Neck, Old English Game Hen, and the Yokohama. Um, there are other birds like this. These are just a few that I that I stuck on my list. Now, um, like I said, chicken chicken chickens are a species that is still being developed, domesticated um, for the homestead and for other purposes, and you can kind of see that happening, you know, just on the homestead and in, in hatcheries and anybody that has chickens, you're going to be, every time you purchase a Dale chick, you put in your vote on which, what you like and uh, the people that are responsible for developing those chicken breeds are going to notice that, they're going to see a need and they're going to want to fill it. And so um, be vocal about what you like or what you don't like or even what you're looking for in a chicken and you know, help that, help that species to be developed even further. Now that we've discussed the history and some of the regional developments of chicken, um, we're going to kind of zero in on the homesteading or production chicken. Um, the first being a meat chicken or a broiler, um, as, as they're often called. Now these chickens are developed to be fast growing, reaching their um, butcher weight within f about five weeks is ideal. Um, some can be more. Common meat bird varieties are the Cornish Cross, which is actually at the top of the list for most people. They are able to give you the highest, um, the highest amount of production for the lowest cost, which is why a lot of chicken farmers use them when they're, when they're raising chickens for meat. Others on that list would be the Red Ranger or the Freedom Ranger. That's the same, same thing with two different names. The thing to remember about raising meat birds is that you can't buy 10 birds, eat one, and save the rest for later. Because like any animal, if you're familiar with hunting or raising any kind of livestock, um, the younger the better. <laughs> right and so you need to take that into consideration too is that you meat chickens don't just get to stay around forever they live about four or five weeks and then they go to freezer camp and they live in your freezer until dinner time um, and so you need to make sure that you have the facility to be able to to deal with whatever number of birds you purchase and keep on your homestead and do it all in one day or all in a, you know this span of a couple of days we are not prepared for anything probably over five birds <laughs> or so we are still learning and so um, this year when we do finally get our meat chickens it's gonna be a small batch of meat chickens so that we can learn as we go we're not gonna start off with a hundred or even fifty birds we're not even gonna do twenty we're gonna do five and while that doesn't like it doesn't even make a dent in our chicken consumption, you know, for the year. Um, it is a baby step on the way to being self-sustainable. We're focused more on the skill um, than on filling our freezer, and uh, I think that that's a valuable thing to remember uh, when you're first starting out homesteading is that um, the skills take precedence over the replacing what you're buying at the grocery store and you can't do it all all at once or you're going to burn yourself out.
Uh, our second category is the dual purpose bird, um, which like I said, can be used for egg laying or it can be used for meat depending on the diet that you feed it. Um, they are adequate egg providers, adequate meat providers, and so um, the spectacular thing about them is that, that they could provide either, even though they're not the greatest egg layers and they're not maybe the biggest or most tasty meat birds, they can provide both um, and they're great to have on the homestead. These are a chicken where you can purchase 50, eat one now, save the rest for later or you know eat one now and and uh, and have the rest for egg production because they are used for that they tend to be a very hardy I don't know a farmer that's gonna have a livestock animal on his farm that doesn't produce anything and so or that isn't gonna be able to weather out some adversity and and so um, I would expect dual purpose chickens to be very hardy um, and very stout. Obviously, like I said, you want to feed the chicken the appropriate diet for its duty. Um, you go to the feed store and you buy a bag that either says egg layer pellet or egg layer crumble or you buy the meat chicken feed. <laughs> like, it's, not, it's not a hard thing to figure out. Examples of favorite dual purpose birds will be the Sussex, the Wyandotte, the Orpington, Plymouth Rock, and the Delaware. These are my short list of examples. Heritage breeds, um, many are dual purpose breeds. Like I said, um, dual, dual purpose chickens were mainly developed by farmers. I have, I have to say that with confidence because um, they are such a great homesteading bird. Um, a lot of the heritage breeds that you will see um, throughout history in America are dual purpose. They reach four to five pounds in about 16 weeks. Um, they do have longer lifespans. They tend to be um, more adapted to adversity. Um, examples of the heritage breeds will be Ancona, Andalusian, Brahma, Australorp, and Orpington. Category 4 of production and homestead chickens, we have egg layers. Now, um, out of this selection, right, out of, out of the best egg layers, your chickens are going to be providing 150 to 300 eggs yearly um, over the course of two to three years. So um, once a chicken reaches about the age of two or three, uh, it's it's not going to be producing as well. So egg production, um, it, it doesn't have only to do with the breed. There are breeds that are more readily will more readily lay for you, um, but egg production really comes down to is the diet, their environment, whether they're comfortable or not, how much space they have, how much forage they have, um, their age. Okay, so this, this last category is of my own development. I really wanted to highlight um, the uses for older birds um, because I think there is more value than people will, people will maybe attribute to having an older chicken. Um, so retired, retired layers or meat chickens that maybe got past their prime. <laughs> Um, well, they're still good for a nice chicken stew, um, especially if they're just hanging around and they're not really any use to you. But some, but some can be useful, especially those that tend to be really good foragers um, or really good mothers, really good brooders. You know, select a, select a handful of those chickens out of your flock if you have a bit of bigger flock and let them stay around um, for their for the value of their guidance and for the value of their skills, you know. Um, I, I labeled this category working flocks, right? So we're looking at the value of pest control, weed control, predator alert, um, manure and compost 
production, you know, the chickens are still going to be around and eating and producing uh, manure. And not only that, but they're going to be able to help you turn your compost piles if you allow them access to that. You can keep some around as brood hens. So while they may not be laying, they can allow your other hens to lay um, by just taking over a flock of chicks you know, and letting them raise them because they're going to be a lot better at alerting to predators and they're going to be a lot better at finding food and foraging. They're going to have a lot of that skill. Why not let them bring up your younger, <laughs> your younger generation? Oh, I'm discussing chickens and their uses and I just find so much wisdom and value for life in it, you know, and we're talking about chickens. They should I'll just be dinner, but, you know, I just, I was thinking on this, and, and, uh, well, it is nice to have a good stew hen for a good chicken soup or something like that. Um, there is, there is value in maturity, in having that maturity in your flock. Um, young hens tend to be really dumb. I just lost three to the dogs, and they could have just gone and hidden in their house and been safe and fine, and, uh, so, well, it broke my heart to lose a few of my favorite chickens. Um, the ones I have now are my favorite because they're alive. <laughs> because they uh, survived the massacre that was a few days ago. And uh, there's a reason for that, <laughs> you know. We are on to the last section. Um, I understand now why I was a little bit overwhelmed and procrastinating, and that is because this is a lot of information. Um, to be sharing and that now I kind of wish I had split it into two different videos but uh, as it is it will be fine okay so um, my last little study here is uh, temperament and personality and we're gonna look at um, the different characteristics I guess of chickens and so um, at the top we have friendliness, just as a little, you know, asterisk, handle your chicks when they're young. Hold them, cuddle them, be friendly with them. If they know that you're their mother hen, they're going to be a lot more friendly with you and with other people because they'll know they can trust humans. But some that are genetically given to friendliness are silkies, uh, the Sussex. Orpington, Rhode Island Red, Cochin, and Wyandotte. Now, a lot of these are on those other lists, right? A lot of these are on those other dual purpose meat egg layer heritage breeds um, list. And uh, I think that that's for a reason. I, I don't want to have chickens around my kids that are going to be mean and nasty or that are just gonna always run, or w run away. My kids want to be curious and to touch and hold and love on the chickens and so I want some around that are going to be given to that. Second category is foragers or free rangers. Now keep in mind when you're selecting your chickens, especially for a flock that you intend to have foraging or free ranging at any time um, which means outside of a protected run. Um, there are aerial predators. And with that being said, uh, just like with humans, the fattest ones are the hardest to kidnap. And so I appreciate having some fat birds in my flock. <laughs> I, I appreciate having the heavy breeds um, and not the tiny little the tiny little twerpy ones. <laughs> I like a good meaty <laughs> egg layer because I don't want them to get snatched up out of the air. If they do, I want them to land somewhere and and hopefully be salvageable. Um, now, these are commonly the Hamburg, Leghorn, Plymouth Rock, Rhode Island Red. These are these are chickens that are really given to foraging and they, they like to be out and about doing things. Um, but I guess as you're, as you're looking at this list of, of chickens that you might like to have in a foraging flock, consider the size, 
consider what kind of property you have. If you have plenty of places for chickens to hide, why not have some little, some little twerpy ones? But, you know, here at our place, uh, we don't have a lot of places for chickens to hide from aerial predators. And so we, we went for some of those heavier, heavier breeds of chickens. Uh, okay, my third category is broody hens. All right, so now don't go out, don't go and seek out a broody hen um, unless you can have a rooster, right? I, I just feel like that's a really mean thing to do to a chicken, to, to purchase and own a chicken that, that really lives for, <laughs> for, um, for raising chicks and sitting on eggs. Like, some chickens will do it for a long time, and they can cause themselves a lot of health issues because of it, um, because when a chicken goes broody, they just sit on their nest, you know, incubating eggs, whether they're fertilized or not, they're going to sit there and they're going to hatch those eggs and so they end up having, um, they can starve themselves, they can dehydrate themselves, they can really have a lot of health issues and it's really a stressful time on a hen when they go broody and um, without having fertilized eggs, you know, without having an end in sight, I feel that it's very cruel. I lost my recording. It only goes for a certain amount of time. Um, so, broody hens. I, I've had a few go broody in the last year. <laughs> like, a few. And um, I know that a lot of people will, will take their broody hens and separate them from the flock and put them into a kennel or some sort of area where they can't sit and nest. And... You know, I, I just find that to be cruel. <laughs> I think that that's not, that's not kind and it's not, it's not the best way. And if you do that or have done that, that's okay to each his own. But I choose not to because I, I think that, you know, letting the chicken figure it out on their own is the best way. Now, I will, when I do have a broody hen, I will go out and I'll take, I'll take her out of the nest box and put her right in front of some food and water so that I know she's getting at least one meal a day and, and enough water. Um, and then I just let her do her thing until she's done. And I've never had a, I've never had a chicken go broody for more than a couple weeks at a time. And I'm not going to be so fussy over a loss of eggs that I... I'm concerned about breaking a chicken any sooner than that. Not to mention that when you separate a hen out of the flock, uh, the pecking order has to be reestablished when they go back. And they can end up, you know, they've just spent a, <laughs> they've just had a few stressful days inside of a dog kennel in an environment that they're not familiar with. And now you're putting them back with a flock that thinks them dead. <laughs> You know, it thinks that they disappeared and the pecking order has already been reestablished. And so I, I consider it less stressful on my chicken and a lot kinder to just bring them out, make sure they're fed and watered and, and let them do their thing until they're done. Um, a lot of people will go and they'll either purchase day old chicks or they'll purchase some fertilized eggs and put them into a nest so a chicken can hatch them out and raise them young. I don't have the I don't have the privilege of having a lot of space at my homestead and so that's not an option for me um, to you know be able to add, just continue adding chicks endlessly uh, to my property. I have to I have to manage the numbers and so I just wait until the chicken realizes that nothing has happened um, and and leaves the nest and uh, I just keep close monitoring on her. If you're on an urban homestead or a suburban homestead, um, maybe a, maybe either avoid or, or know beforehand how you're going to manage um, these instances when a hen goes broody, but 
common, common breeds of chickens that will go broody are the Sussex, Cochin, Orpington, Brahma, Silky, and the Dominique. And, and, you know, obviously none of these lists are complete. They're just a selection of, of breeds that I know of or that I've found in my researching for this video um, that were out there. Okay, so, so that is about the end. I do want to sum up our conversation here with a few details. Um, roosters. I have no rooster. You don't need roosters to have eggs. You do need roosters to have chicks, which is why I say if you have a broody hen, maybe you get fertilized eggs or some day-old chicks to stick under there. Um, roosters are pretty pretty commonly um, rejected <laughs> in urban settings. Um, they There's a lot of zoning laws that will tell you you can't have a rooster. Um, my, my zoning law, you know, for where I live prohibits roosters in, in the city and, and, and it actually limits me to how many chickens I can have also. And so, um, just know that if you want a, a flock of backyard chickens, you can get just tent and not have any roosters. You can do that and still get eggs. Um, Roosters, roosters tend to be hit and miss. A really good one will be an excellent livestock guardian for the rest of your flock. They will watch out for those hens. They will treat them kindly. And man, they're, they're really good at keeping predators away and even for alerting to predators. Um, however, if you do get a bad rooster, don't waste your time. Don't waste your time trying to break it. Just eat your soup. Just have your roast chicken <laughs> and eat your chicken noodle soup and be done with it. I have heard horror stories of roosters harming children or chasing down their owners, not letting them into the coop to get eggs. Just don't mess with it. Um, if you can't do it yourself, have someone come over and take care of your rooster, sell the rooster, Whatever it is you have to do, don't waste your time on a rooster that's even questionable. Um, hang around and find one that you know to be um, an excellent one that will look out for your girls. Um, okay, so my last thing I want to do is just look at the benefits. I want to discuss the benefits of having a chicken on the homestead. Um, Obviously, they're small livestock, so children, women, old people, disabled people can pretty, pretty easily handle them um, and care for them without much of a problem. They're small in body and space requirements, so I keep mine in about a, what is it, I think it's like a 10 by 20, does that sound right, 30 by 30, 30 by 30 run, which is not much. Um, you know, I if I even lived on a smaller lot, I would probably have chickens now knowing how much space they don't need. Um, they're great for kids. Um, the kids had to be watched. My kids are, well, my kids were three and four when we got the chickens, and um, they had to be supervised with them when they were little babies but now that they're older my kids just love the chickens they have so much fun feeding them um, they have a lot of fun when they get to touch them or or go feed them food scraps they have a lot of fun with the chickens so um, let's see we were doing two sacks of feed a month two bags of feed a month uh, but it will have gone down now because we've done a little bit of adjusting and we've lost a few chickens And so we're probably looking at two bags of feed for about three months now, which is Super cheap a bag of feed is is gonna be cost you less than $20 and For feeding multiple animals off that for multiple months. That's a That's a great return for your investment um, We get free fertilizer and not only that, but my chickens turn my compost for me, and so they're actually 
paying for themselves, you know. They are saving me time and effort in the long run. Um, my chickens are great for pest control. They're going to eat fly larvae. They're going to eat beetles and bugs and all that other stuff that can be found in my garden. And I really appreciate that, that I'm not going to have to go digging for bugs or spraying anywhere. They're going to really help control that. Um, obviously the eggs are cool. I'm in an urban homestead. Uh, share your eggs with your neighbors. My neighbors all love when I bring them eggs. It's such a treat for them. And so, you know, especially if you have some neighbors that are like, oh, I just don't know. You know, just take them some eggs. Take them some eggs, some yogurt, and a loaf of bread and say, here, thank you so much for being my neighbor. We really appreciate you. And leave it at that. And your neighbors will will see the value in having you next door <laughs> um, if you take, if you share, you know, your product. Um, obviously, um, meat chickens are great for a homestead, um, depending on where you live. If it's an urban homestead that you have, you may have run into some issues on how, you know, being able to butcher your chickens. In the middle of the city, I I intend to find a space for our meat chickens where nobody can see me and be disturbed <laughs> by watching me um, kill and eat my food. <laughs> you know, I feel like I feel like we have lost so much of of the value of that primitive life. You know, I, it's not that I, it's not that I take my chicken's life lightly. I, it's always, it's always something that's difficult for me. And I don't ever want to invalidate someone else's emotion or, or sensitivity about killing and eating your own food. But this is what it comes to for me. I've seen those documentaries of chicken houses and egg houses where where chickens are stacked in cages or on the floor swimming in their own, you know, um, and I don't want that. I don't want to put that in my mouth. I don't want to put it in my body. I would rather, I would rather know where my food is coming from and have to really feel the loss of life that comes when you do kill and eat your own food. I want to know that that is a huge responsibility that I'm taking on. Instead of being able to go to the grocery store and pick up a, pa a pack of chicken meat and take that for granted, I never want to take um, what goes into my body for granted. I want to be thankful and I want to treat it, be able to treat it with respect and that is part of that process. Being able to to butcher and, and process your own food, that is part of um, teaching my children respect for what for what they have um, it's teaching them to be thankful and it's teaching them to just um, to understand the high value um, of a life and so I want to be courteous of my neighbors and not do it right out in the open probably <laughs> or do it at a time when I when I know people are not around and, and be respectful of my neighbors in that way, not not that I'm hiding anything in shame. And yeah, consider that when you're living in an urban site on an urban homestead, you know, be respectful and be caring and loving of your neighbors um, in everything that you do. Be generous with what you have and give it to them. Um, Chickens are low maintenance and easy. One person can do it. Um, they're, they're a low impact livestock. You know, anytime you're talking about homesteading or farming, you, you have to be real with yourself and consider that, especially when you're brand new learning, there is gonna be some loss. And I would rather, um, I would rather nurture my wisdom and grow my knowledge on on a type of livestock that doesn't cost me two or three hundred dollars a head. Three dollars and fifty cents each is 
exactly what I want to be spending for my education and again this is <laughs> I don't say that lightly or as a joke I say it because I'm serious about it I don't I would love to have goats but I know that I'm not ready for that and if I have to have a loss I want it to be a small one and while I love my chickens and I love each and every single one of them I, I care for them I would rather lose a chicken than a goat or I would rather lose a chicken than a milk cow or you know on and on we could go um, so when you're first starting out homesteading I think chickens um, or rabbits are a great way to go because of the low impact um, chickens are easy to come by um, and and while they provide a great value on the homestead they are something that is easily replaceable and so um, those are the considerations that I take especially in my urban setting I want to be wise and I want to be loving and caring of my neighbors and so I don't want to do anything that would be met with disapproval and I don't want to do anything that would disrupt the lives of the people that I live near um, because you know I I I rub up against them every day I have people on absolutely every side of my house um, watching the life that I live and how I care for my things and I want to do it um, in a way that is going to reflect well on my family and well on my on my own integrity and so yeah I think I that's it for today um, I know that was a little bit of a long-winded video but I hope that you learned something um, I hope that you enjoyed hanging out with me today um, I am just about done with this ball of dough we're gonna see how it turns out and I'm gonna finish it up now okay I just want to show you really quickly the tail end of my yogurt making right here okay so I have my, my driveway my stack of yogurt and I have this container excuse me and then I have this container of whey so I'm going to give you I'm just going to give you a quick view of how I finish up my yogurt um, since I'm doing it anyway so you'll be able to see the finished product really quick okay so I am going to remove I'm sorry for the terrible view I'm going to remove my flour sack of yogurt into my bowl here I'm going to take my jar of whey and I'm just going to add it over here. Actually, I, for your benefit, I'm going to measure it first. I just changed my mind. Okay, so we're going to measure this and see how much whey I ended up with. Okay, right, so this is about almost a quart of whey that I got from two liters of milk. Okay. I'm probably going to have to voice over this part because um, I have Harry Potter going on in the background and have not the recording rights for it. So in we go and this is all going to go into the dog's food probably which is just my most convenient use of, of the way and that's fine okay so here oops here we have my yogurt right there I'm going to take my string off should probably wash it. Open up my flour sack towel and we're going to see how this looks in here. Though so this has been hanging on my cupboard, uh, well, since we started doing chores this morning, so 
a few hours long enough for the whey to drip to stop dripping I just kind of I just kind of eyeball it um, and decide when I think it's had enough but usually it's when the whey quits dripping now it should peel away from your flour sack towel pretty easily okay so ugh, I'm trying to get this so you can see it but I just don't have a good spot for my camera so it should peel right off the towel I'm gonna get these couple small spots of yogurt and this will go to the wash <clears throat> Okay, so now that we've got this here, you can see it's kind of lumpy in texture. So I'm going to take my beater. I'm going to take my beater and just give it a mix. you can see nice and creamy yogurt this will be um, a very Greek yogurt I had to move that so that I could get to my yogurt jar now I keep so we I save our jelly jars from Costco um, and use them because they make excellent yogurt jars. Just the right size that I usually need. I use my canning funnel here and I'm going to just scoop my yogurt into my jar. is done. Now that that is done, we are also going to go and check on my bread dough. We're going to go and check on my bread dough and see if it's risen. I, I want to say it's been about 45 minutes, but I'm not sure. I'm just flying by the seat of my pants. It's going to be a little dark in here, but that's okay. Alright, so perfect place for keeping dough. Ooh, wow. <laughs> okay. I think that's just about right. So what I'm going to do now with this dough is I'm going to knock it back, which means I'm just going to give it a, a gentle kneading to get all the large air pockets out. I'm going to put it in my tins and let it rise again for probably about half an hour before I finally throw it in the oven and bake it. So let me turn my camera back and you can see how I do that. So my recipe says another 30 to 45 minutes for my second rise on my bread. Um, I will link this recipe from the Brown Eyed Baker on my 
in my description box down below. I will also beg my mother-in-law um, for the sharing of her yogurt recipe and see if I can stick that in my box. I'll link some cheesecloth towels. I will link the... Mm. I'll link some bread making tins. What else should I put in there? I think that's it. I think that's all I, I want or need to share uh, this go around. Um, thanks for hanging out for a really lengthy video. Um, hopefully you learned something in um, watching the chaos of my morning unfold. Um, I really enjoyed sharing with you about uh, the history and kind of the development of different chicken breeds and I hope I gave you a lot to think about if you're considering buying chickens. Um, please don't let this uh, flood of information overwhelm you. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, leave them in the, de in the comment section below. Um, like this video if you enjoyed watching and don't forget to hit subscribe. Uh, yeah, I think that is it. I enjoyed hanging out with you today, and I hope you feel the same. Uh, we'll catch you later. Live simply.